Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Once again, Frozen is in the headlines and that's because it's exactly where Disney wants it to stay. Uh, and they keep churning out more Frozen products. Uh, although everyone seems to be a surprise. Uh, while many of us are excited about the potential of a Frozen 2, even I would uh, like to see Disney go that route, and even uh, the theatrical, uh, I mean, uh, and by theatrical I mean a stage version, of perhaps a Broadway, uh, you know, eventually get to Broadway uh, version of the show, I think that's something else people uh, were very eager for. But we seem to be getting everything but uh, a, a uh, a movie sequel or a, mus a live musical show. Uh, now, of course, Frozen will be appearing on Once Upon a Time, uh, you know, in some ways for the entire season, or, or as many of you pointed out, uh, as the main focus of the show for half a season. Uh, and then also it was announced uh, over the weekend that Disney is putting out a series of books about Frozen, which will be where the story officially continues. What a surprise, not in an animated uh, series on television, uh, not in a movie. Uh, I guess to some degree the story will continue in Once Upon a Time, although that's not uh, in canon. I think that's like supposed to be an alternate universe, if I'm correct. Uh, so this will be, I guess, the official continuation of the story of Frozen. Uh, the first two books will come out January 6th, 2015, so mark your calendars, Frozen fans. Uh, they'll be directed at a younger uh, uh, demographic, so expect a reading level uh, in that area. Uh, and they'll come out, uh, as I said, January 6th, and they'll be putting out three to four books a year. This will be an ongoing series. And they'll be called Anna and Elsa. And then they'll have subtitles. The first one is All Hail the Queen, which I have to admit is a pretty cool title. I would, I would be into picking that up, perhaps. Uh, and then also Memory and Magic. That'll be the second title, which seems a little bit more in the realm of your typical uh, young uh, book aimed at young girls. Now, Disney's had a lot of success in the, uh, liter in the literature area with Never Girls, another book series that they have about four young girls who find themselves transported to Neverland. And they largely interact with the characters in Pixie Hollow. Of course, a very big property for Disney, uh, direct to video. They put out a number of films, they do quite well. Uh, the latest was The Pirate Fairy, uh, and, and, you know, Tom Hiddleston voicing Captain Hook, uh, a young Captain Hook. So, you know, Disney knows this area very well. Uh, they know this level of branding at this target audience. And I think that it seems that they've decided that this is where they should take Frozen next. Now, I think this is very surprising. And I'm really wondering, who is in charge of the overall Frozen brand? You know, just like Kevin Feige oversees the Marvel movies and, uh, you know, they just put someone in charge of the Harry Potter brand over at Warner Brothers. DC still lacks uh, that linchpin, which I think would really help them a lot in planning their cinematic universe. Uh, Mark Millar is supposed to be doing it, or Mark Miller is supposed to be doing it over at Fox for their Marvel properties. Uh, and then uh, I think, you know, obviously, uh, uh, Sony maybe had wanted Drew, Drew Goddard or other people to come in there and take a stronger hand in developing their Spider-Man cinematic universe, but not so not turning out so well. And also, of course, Alex Kurtzman was just hired over at Universal to be in charge of their monsters cinematic universe that they're building. So it's great to have a point person where you know the buck stops here, literally in Hollywood. Uh, you know. For, for who's in charge of how the story is progressing. Uh, and so I'm wondering if Disney should maybe pick somebody to handle that for Frozen, because it seems like the thing is just going off in so many different directions uh, that nobody is there to protect the brand. Now, of course, writing ideas. Ideas were a strong point for Frozen, and I think one of the reasons that it hit, uh, hit such a home run. Uh, but I think when you look at the actual quality of the writing and the story structure, uh, it's it, it, at the very least, it could be improved. You know, I think some would say it's seriously flawed, like myself, but writing is never, I guess we can never say, been the strongest point when it comes to Frozen. But I think if they want to continue to master this brand and to keep it going and to hold on to its huge strength as, as a brand and its mass appeal, they need to make sure that someone is really keeping an eye on it instead of just giving it to everyone to play with as they see fit. Uh, so I'm just curious, do you, so how do you feel about continuing the story of Anna and Elsa on the page, and for in, in, in young readers, no less. You know, uh, uh, books aimed at a much younger audience. You know, not the all ages appeal of the film. Do you think this 
uh, makes it harder to have a, a sequel to Frozen. I mean, it takes a, it's a lot of work to have a, a sequel to these animated films, uh, but I still believe, as I've been saying for a while now, that Disney should be fast-tracking a Frozen sequel to theaters. I think it was such a successful film, uh, and that have had so much success with Toy Story, which actually it turns out uh, it has similar Frozen has similar brand strength to the Toy Story brand out of Pixar, that I would consider making a, a sequel, and I would I would actually back burner other projects to make way for Frozen 2. Uh, but I'm just curious if you think this is a good idea, if you think Disney can keep this on track, even considering that they had a hard time getting it on track and didn't even know it was on track until it was released. Uh, and uh, is this the way you want to see the story continue? Is it going to hold your interest if this is how, uh, if this is the new way that you can experience Frozen? All right, so that's the first story of the day. The second story of the day is I want to take a look at these great character posters for The Hunger Games Mockingjay, which just came out late last week. I think they're really a lot of fun, uh, and I continue to think it's fascinating how they're spotlighting everybody but Katniss uh, and Gail uh, to some degree, and we've just seen a little bit of PETA, but where is Katniss? Even in her own teaser trailer, she just showed up at the very end. Now, some could argue they're trying to build her up to legendary status. Uh, you know, you just see her back for a good part of that teaser trailer. But as I've said before, I largely believe that uh, Lionsgate is trying to pull some of the power away uh, from Jennifer Lawrence over this franchise so they don't end up with a Robert Downey Jr. Avengers situation, where he's so crucial to the success of that series that he can really basically just get a blank blank check from Disney. And I don't think Lionsgate doesn't want to write any blank checks to Jennifer Lawrence, and so I think you can see them already taking steps to uh, build up the Hunger Games brand itself uh, and make it not so reliant on Katniss and therefore Jennifer Lawrence. As I said, they're considering spin-off films, and they're also considering a potential theme park. There will be a tour uh, that's going to go around the country, I believe, with Mockingjay to test the waters for a potential you know, permanent theme park. So look out for those tickets for those of you. A lot of you say, oh, it's appalling for the idea of a theme park, but I bet a lot of you would go. I don't know if it could be as well realized as uh, Diagon Alley, the, you know, just opened Universal for Harry Potter and, and the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in general. I think I could see a lot of potential, although I don't think it should have its own park. I think Lionsgate should license it out to another, like to Universal perhaps, uh, and so it can join that experience. Because I think when I travel specifically to go to the Hunger Games uh, world, no, I don't think that I would. But I, would I go there and be excited when I was visiting a theme park I already enjoyed? Definitely. All right, so I like my, I'm going to put my favorite poster first, and this is Effie. Uh, Deglamorized as best she could uh, for uh, joining the joining the rebellion. Now, uh, there I don't want to give spoilers away, so we're just going to have a loose discussion about these characters. Uh, but I just, you know, one of the big ways that Effie is described uh, in the Mockingjay films is that she has very vacant eyes after what she's been through. And I think that Elizabeth Banks is capturing that perfectly. But I just, I love the fact that she's still trying to dress up her outfit as much as she can. You know, her she's she's down but she's not out. And I just think that this this to me is very a very striking image and not only conveying uh you know the the character but you know the direction that the franchise is headed in. So I just think it's really clever and endearing and is my favorite of the new posters. Uh next, I was really surprised that they gave Philip Seymour Hoffman a poster. Now, I'm glad that he can still be continue uh, a part of the film and that it's uh you know, it he had, didn't have to be edited out, and then he shot most of his scenes before he tragically passed away, uh, uh, you know, from a drug overdose. You know, it wasn't like he had an accident. It was, you know, a really bad situation. Uh, but I don't know if he, I would give him an entire poster, because I don't think he's, I mean, I haven't seen the film yet, obviously, but he's not, you know, this isn't Heath Ledger and the Joker. He's not as integral to the film. So to give him his own poster, I just, I, I think it draws attention away from the film and keeping you in the world of the film, and it, you know, it just reminds you that he's not with us anymore. Uh, so I think he's fine to be in the film, but I wouldn't play it up too much in the advertising. I don't know. This is a difficult conversation to have. I'm sure some people would say that it would be disrespectful to take him out of it. So I might just boil down to a personal opinion. But, so I guess I would include him on posters in general, but I, does he need his own poster? I, I don't know. But it's interesting to see that he's going to clearly be a big part of this franchise, uh, even after his passing. All right, next, we get our President Coin poster. I think this looks great. I like it a lot. I think it's very telling that she is the only one here 
who has put herself with the Mockingjay symbol. Uh, you know, is she trying to co-opt it, take it away from Katniss? I think that's really fascinating. Uh, she's like, we don't need Katniss, as we've seen from the teaser trailer. She's like, everyone just follow me. And I think Julianne Moore has potential to really knock it out of the park with this role. I'm also impressed with how Donald Sutherland has been stepping up his game as President Snow, and you could see a real battle between the two of them, mostly in, uh, you know, propaganda. You know, I don't think face-to-face, -face, but still very very exciting and you know we've seen so many actresses phone it in like Kate Winslet in Divergent, Meryl Streep in the upcoming The Giver uh, it's great to see uh, an actress join one of these franchises and dig in and really contribute so I'm excited to see what she does I think her hair looks phenomenal she looks really great uh, I, know I made a big deal about Wonder Woman's hair but President Coyne understands the importance of a blowout so she looks great and I'm very 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 excited for her role in this film uh, next we've got BT uh, I think it's really interesting that he's in a wheelchair. I mean, I know I know my Hunger Games stuff pretty well, but obviously I didn't read the book, so I still I get surprised every now and then, and this is a surprise to me. And I really like Jeffrey Wright, and I hope to see more of him in this film. Uh, he's a really great actor, uh, really under you know underappreciated, and I think he too could bring a lot to the table here. I like seeing so I like seeing a focus on him as well. Uh, then I really love. Uh, you know, Sam Claflin, who plays Finnick O'Dare. I think he's a really talented actor. I'm very excited for his future in Hollywood. Uh, I think he'd make a great Peter Pan. I think Warner Brothers missed a huge opportunity there. And I think that his role in Catching Fire was really, I think, should have been a breakout role for him. It hasn't really materialized yet. We'll see. But he's just waiting for some studio to snatch him up. Marvel, DC, you guys are really you know, in, a, in a talent race. Somebody should call dibs on this guy. Or Fox could swoop in and pick him up for their Marvel films. But uh, I think this is great to see him included here. I think it's interesting that we have Finnick, not Gale, who does factor, lar factor into this uh, the Mockingjay story quite a bit. And it's Finnick who gets a poster, not Gale. Uh, and, you know, not Katniss. And, you know, PETA, of course, isn't in District 13 right now. But still really spreading the attention to other characters and actors. And then last but not least, certainly not least, Woody Harrelson as Haymitch. I really like this character a lot. Uh, I think Woody Harrelson is a phenomenal actor. Recently someone pointed out to me and they said, you know, Woody Harrelson just does not get enough credit for being such a phenomenal actor. He always delivers, be it Hunger Games or True Detective or Now You See Me. He is a great actor and I think he really is. And I was happy in Catch and Fire that he was given more to do more to sink his teeth into as a great actor, and I'm hoping that that continues in Mockingjay. Uh, and I think he looks he looks great here, and he too. You can see the people who spent a lot of time in the Capitol, uh, you know, he and Effie in particular, have maintained their uh, cool factor, their sense of their sense of style. You know, it, it's a it's a I guess it just gets ingrained in you personally. So I really like these posters a lot. I think they're great, and it gives me a little more faith in you know this franchise switching gears, which is going to be very tricky to pull off to really just change the entire higher uh, viewpoint uh, and setting and location, the whole kind of movie that it is. I think people are going to be really surprised. So it looks to me like the, the PR team, at least, is doing a really good job of, ease, of, doing, of making that transition, uh, making it smooth, slow, and if they're lucky, no one will really even notice until they're like, oh, hey, yeah, you did pull that off. Great job. I loved the movie. That's hopefully what we'll all be saying later this year. So that's the second story of the day. The third story is about Gamora. Now, a number of you sent me this article that's been going around on the internet. Uh, I saw the one that the Mary Sue picked up uh, about how there is not enough Gamora merchandise. Uh, and not only does Gamora not have, from Guardians of the Galaxy, not only does Gamora not have any mer merchandise herself, you know, singularly Gamora, like t-shirts, action figures, etc., but even on the group merchandise, where they have the whole team, Gamora is left off, so it's all the male characters. And some people have pointed out, and they said, do you really feel Marvel and whatever licensing uh, brands have picked up the rights to Guardians of the Galaxy to put on merchandise, that a little boy or a man will not wear a shirt that has a, a girl on it, even if she's part of the group? Uh, that's kind of where people are coming from. And I noticed the same thing that happens with uh, the Avengers and Black Widow. She's always left off. Uh, and I think some of you pointed that out as well. And that's always frustrating to me when, you know, Avengers was at its height. And even today, when I see Avengers group shots, uh, especially dealing with the cinematic universe, I always do a quick scan to see if Black Widow is included. Uh, for instance, there's the, uh, even the Marvel Universe Live. It's a traveling show right now. Uh, and some of the initial posters that I saw, no female characters were on this 
freaking poster. It was so frustrating to me. I've seen a, a Black Widow included on some of the posters going forward, but the first couple of times I saw the ads for it, I was like, it's all boys. What if a little girl wanted to see that show? Or maybe would want to see it if she saw Black Widow up there. Uh, now, we've discussed this before about licensing, and, you know, I brought up the fact that when I was at Marvel, I talked to their licensor, and he said, you know what, this female merchandise just, just doesn't sell. People say they'd like to see it, but not enough people actually buy it when it is created. Now, that might have been the situation in the past, but, you know, as a number of you also pointed out to me, Guardians of the Galaxy had the biggest percentage of female, uh, of female audience members yet for a Marvel movie at 44%. That's up just 4% from the Avengers, which I think was like a 40 or so, but still, that's very high, and it's going in the right direction. It's increasing. So even if in the past there wasn't an interest in these characters, you know, that was back in the day when they were mostly on animated shows, although female audiences are also growing for that, you know, quite a bit of female fans for Young Justice. Uh, where also they had a real lack of, you know, merchandise aimed at the female characters for f uh, female fans. Uh, but, you know, it was from the comic books, and there weren't a lot of uh, girls who watched that and women who appreciated it. But as the movies make this, a, you know, a bigger brand, I think that it's, an, it's important uh, to, to recognize that, and perhaps there are people who will buy it now. And I think that it's the responsibility of Marvel, especially if they want to see these characters succeed in the long run, to try and just test the waters with some, with some merchandise, and maybe not make it so difficult. So there are two things I want to ask you. One, guys, would you have a problem wearing a shirt if it had a girl on it just as part of the group? Would you be like, man, I can't wear this shirt, it's got a chick on it? Or would you be like, I love Gamora. I have the whole team now on my shirt. Yay. Uh, and also, are any of you, male or female, interested in buying female, you know, Gamora merchandise? You know, with merchandise with female characters in it or portrayed. The action figures, the shirts, uh, the lunch cups, etc. The whole thing. You know, do you think that they should be doing this? Or do you think that young girls, for some reason, still focus? They all, at the end of the day, want the Disney princess stuff. Uh, you know, why isn't Disney create uh, a female superhero line to compete and see if they could make it work? They have a couple now where, you know, you can put Pepper Potts in there because she wore the Iron Man armor, right? So you've got at least Black Widow and Gamora. Why can't you create uh, a line of merchandise that goes around that? Uh, and also, you know, the comments lately about Kevin Feige, you know, not really making it a priority to have a female uh, solo a superhero movie. It's just, you know, I wonder how long this will continue that the female audience grows for the Marvel films without any recognition from Marvel itself, be it merchandise or a movie. Just do you think we're heading towards a breaking point, or at least where this is going to come to a head? Or do you think people will just continue to be like, well, well I would have liked to see it, but I'm not going to get too upset about it. So that's the third story of the day. For the viewer question, I actually want to discuss kind of like a, a series of discussions that went on over the weekend. And that's the idea of whether or not I should rate movies. Uh, somebody made a really good point, because uh, a number of people uh, seemed to decide that I hated Guardians of the Galaxy, which wasn't true. I said that it was a medium film. It was an okay movie. Uh, as you might recall, the opening line in my review was, I applaud its ingenuity, but I detest its unprofessionalism. And that washes out to an okay film. Now, I think detest, where I might have, you know, gotten myself in trouble, was that's too strong a word. Uh, but I was upset because, you know, I expect more from Marvel, uh, and so I was just very disappointed in what I had seen. But as I said, I thought it was an okay movie, and I gave a long list of stuff that I liked, but everybody just focused on what I didn't like, even though that I listed that second, because I wanted the, the beginning pos uh, aspects of the review to be positive. Uh, but, you know, apparently if you don't love every aspect of a movie, some people get upset. But anyway, uh, so somebody had said, oh, Grace hated Guardians of the Galaxy, and somebody rightfully pointed out that I did not hate it, I thought it was okay. Uh, and then someone responded and said, well, maybe there'd be less confusion if Grace actually rated the movie. Uh, you know, gave it a number rating or a, some kind of rating that, you know, could be pointed to as definitive proof of where I stood on the film. So I thought that was a pretty good point, because I was a little frustrated at people being confused as to how I felt about the film or misrepresenting it uh, when I had been very clear, and it was for posterity recorded on YouTube that you could go and check back as much as you wanted to. But people were trying to, to, to spread this misinformation. Some people, some people, uh, but very loud people. Uh, so I went on, onto Twitter and I said, do you think, guys, that I should? I asked you, because you're the one who watched the reviews. I wanted to know what you thought. Would you like to see a rating system? Would that, you know, I, I really appreciate when people give me feedback. If you, as you've seen, I incorporate it. And so this is another instance of me deciding to go to you and say, what would you like to see? And I was very pleased. Some people said they would like to see it, and I appreciate that. But I was very pleased that most of you said, you know, I don't want you to rate the movie. Uh, I think because ratings are so subjective, and I appreciate just listening to your entire uh, reasoning behind the, your thoughts on the film, and then 
drawing my own conclusions based, you know, how I would feel based on how you feel. And the reason I like that is because I agree, I agree very strongly that ratings are subjective. And I was kind of worried about having to be put in a position where I had to put a definitive rating on a film because I would feel uncomfortable doing that. Be and I think that, that that was my main problem with my Guardians of the Galaxy uh, review in that I I projected onto others. I should have just kept it as to why I didn't like the film. And I think that's where I trip myself up by saying, you know, incorrectly, although a number of people don't like the film, but a lot of people do. And I think that I, my being like, who would want to see them return, etc. I should have been like, I don't want to see them return. Uh, although I do want to see Rocket Raccoon and Groot return. And I have to say on a side note, if you are not reading the Rocket Raccoon comic, you are missing out. It's a very good comic, and I think it just does such a great job of capturing what made the character work on the big screen. It really is almost ripped you know, ripped from the, forget ripped from the pages, the Rocket, Ra Rocket Raccoon comic is ripped from the silver screen. So definitely go check that out if you're a fan of that character. Very, very good. The Star-Lord comic, not quite as strong. Although, hey, where's the Gamora comic, right? Uh, oh, it happened again, Marvel. So anyway, I just feel uncomfortable putting a rating on a movie uh, because, you know, that's just my opinion. I don't want to say, oh, Guardians of the Galaxy is this number movie because, you know, other people might not feel the same way. And so I don't like you know, boxing a, prop, a, a property into it. I just like sharing my thoughts on it. Uh, and then, you know, I do, I think I will try to recommend, you know, if you should see it in theaters, uh, if you definitely should see it in theaters, uh, and then also, you know, who might enjoy the film even if I didn't. That's another bit of advice that Audrey Sue, I believe that's the correct name. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for your email. Uh, but she, uh, but she gave me that advice and I implemented it with my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles review and I was very pleased with the way that turned out personally. I hope you were as well. So that's how I feel. I'm not, I'm going to continue you not to rate movies because, you know, and also everybody has a different scale. Some people think, you know, certain numbers are better than others, you know. Some people might say, oh, well, I think an 8 is horrible. And some people are like, I think an 8 is great. Hey, that's, you know, that's a very respectable uh, number. So I just, I just want to keep it the way it is. And I'm really glad that a number of you are enjoying it. Uh, and I also agree with me that you just shouldn't you shouldn't box in a movie like that because everybody look everybody has a you know opinions. That's why we rely on the box office. This is why Hollywood relies on the box office and awards. Those are the only concrete ways of I think really you know judging a film how much it does at the box office and if it earns earns awards because that that everything else is you know. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. All right, so thank you so much for tuning in today to Morning Movie News. Please write down what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question, or in this case, rating films, uh, and let me know what you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.